October's greetings. I'm your host, Dr. Wolfiel, and when I'm not forcing my zombie servant to eat all the poison candy I was hoping to give out this year, I'm here at the Wolfiel reviewing movies. Well, it's Halloween and anything but a happy one. Not only is the world ending, but also for the last October 2020 video, I'm reviewing Halloween 5, The Revenge of Michael Myers. This is where the downward spiral of the Halloween franchise really begins, but I'm getting ahead of myself here. Halloween 4 was a big hit and got audiences interested in not only Michael Myers again, but the film was also a shot in the arm for the horror genre when its popularity in the early to mid 80s was dwindling in the late 80s. Series producer Mustafa Akkad was, in his own words, drunk from the success of the fourth movie. He immediately greenlit a sequel that would be released in October of the following year, 1989, basically running on the almost annual schedule Friday the 13th movies were that eventually led to audiences getting burned out on that franchise. Adding to the rush schedule, well, Halloween 4's director and writer both declined returning for five, so first-time writer Shem Bitterman was brought on board to pen the fifth film script, with the intention of continuing the idea that Jamie would be the series' new killer. Akkad, despite signing off on Halloween 4's ending, didn't like the idea of the franchise going in that direction, even though it seemed the most logical one. So another writer, Michael Jacobs, wrote a script centered on Michael, but production of the fifth film actually began before the screenplay was even finished. That's a good sign. Swiss director Dominique othenin Drard was chosen to helm the film, with all the principal cast members whose characters survived in the previous film returning for the sequel. Let's break down why they lived to regret it with my review of Halloween 5. I must say, though, that Halloween 5 does start off strong. The intro for the film is pretty fantastic. I love that the title card is colored with glowing animated pumpkin guts, with Alan Howarth composing a slow, eerie rendition of the classic Halloween theme that steadily builds up in intensity. Halloween 5 brings back the pumpkin motif of Halloween openings past, but in a more dynamic way, with quick, literal cuts of a pumpkin. A jack-o'-lantern getting carved up like one of Michael's victims, with visceral shots of pumpkin guts. The opening sets a strong tone that, unfortunately, the film doesn't pay off on. Halloween 5 begins with a recap of the last film's ending because they actually have the rights this time around, but some retcons of Halloween 4 are quickly established. Michael isn't shot 100 times by the vigilante death squad. He's instead shot a much more survivable few dozen times. Oh, also the rednecks change into police officers for some fucking reason in the next shot that finally throw the stick of dynamite at the crawling helpless killer because trials are way too messy. Of course, Michael might walk slow, but he can certainly outcrawl an explosion and gets washed away by the river, which is probably his first bath in more than a decade. Aw, it's like Michael's in a lazy river. Whee! Okay, so something worth mentioning. Halloween 5 originally had a different opening, where Michael would be magically healed by some punk rocker-looking dude named Dr. Death, but this scene was reshot after test screenings and replaced with something less fucking stupid. So Michael instead happens upon a kindly hermit living in the woods who nurses this violent masked man to health. I guess they thought they were remaking Bride of Frankenstein or something. A year passes and we rejoin Jamie Lloyd, played for the last time by Danielle Harris, whose backstory of killing her father foster mother has been retconned through flashback into just playfully stabbing Mrs. Carruthers in a more survivable way. Maybe Mrs. Carruthers was brought back to life by Dr. Death. Who knows? Point is, Jamie has been confined to a children's clinic in Haddonfield. Not only does she suffer from troubling visions of her uncle Michael, she's also rendered mute for most of the movie, a very frustrating plot development akin to Jamie Lee Curtis having only 40 seconds of dialogue in Halloween 2. Jamie's muteness was the director's idea, and I guess it's supposed to make Jamie seem like she's becoming like her uncle, but it just sort of derails any potential character development Jamie could have. Daniel Harris does the best job possible playing a silent character, but she just doesn't register much at all in this film, unfortunately. It's just harder to care about her, at least as much as in the fourth film. It doesn't help that the returning Donald Pleasance has to channel the psycho asshole Loomis from Halloween 2, dialed up to Eleven, who is for some reason entrusted with this little girl, even though he pointed a gun at her the first night he met her, and ever since he's been traumatizing and violently jostling this mute little girl. Suddenly dug up a coffin. It was a coffin of a nine-year-old girl. 
Jesus Christ, with this kind of child psychology, no wonder Michael kept killing people. Tone it down. What do you think he's going to do with that? Of course, Michael does return in Halloween 5, or I guess in this film's case, revenge. It takes a year for Michael's health bar to regenerate, and we get an extended glimpse at a tattoo on his wrist of a thorn symbol. A runic derivation of an archaic letter from the old English alphabet. Now, the tattoo has no bearing on this particular film's plot. It's one of two mysterious sequel hooks seated in this movie. I'll be going into great detail about this stuff in next year's October, so get subscribed. But Halloween 5 is what kicked off what is dubbed as the Thorn Trilogy by fans. Halloween 4 is retroactively the first part of this trilogy, of course, but that film wasn't written with any Thorn bullshit, only sharing the same characters. It's kind of unfortunate that one of the reasons Halloween 4 gets a bad rap is because it apparently began the Thorn Trilogy, but that's only incidentally the case. Continuing this movie's parade of bad ideas, the other sequel hook thrown haphazardly into this movie is The Man in Black. Like this is Stephen King's Dark Tower series or something. The Man in Black swings into Haddonfield by, of all modes of transportation, a public bus. So we know he's a big shot. The Man in Black is literally just that. A guy in a black trench coat and we never see his face. The only thing of him shown is that thorn tattoo, same as Michael. And much like the thorn tattoo, the connection between The Man in Black isn't clear in this movie. Besides both characters being played by Don Shea. The Man in Black is seen throughout Halloween 5, Where's Waldo style, but his presence in this film is a bit of a non-sequitur until the end, where he becomes a deus ex machina plot device. The thorn symbol and the Man in Black are, in reality, totally meaningless in this film, written in to establish the foundation of some secret backstory for Michael Myers that could be explored in future films. Thing is, though, the writers of Halloween 5 didn't know what the thorn symbol and Man in Black were when they wrote the film, and they didn't know how this story could be resolved. They basically basically left figuring this stuff out for future writers. It's the kind of lazy, poorly planned mystery box writing that sunk the Star Wars sequel trilogy, and I wouldn't be surprised if J.J. Abrams himself actually ghost wrote a draft of Halloween 5 screenplay. While I'm on the subject of Michael himself, well, overall, the depiction of Michael Myers in Halloween 5 is an improvement over 4, but that's not saying much. Personally, the mask looks better to me in Halloween 5 over Halloween 4. It actually looks more like a defined face with some texture to it, but but the face is still too thin, the neck is too big, and the hair is too long. Where Michael looked like a nerdy accountant in Halloween 4, he looks like a sleazy attorney in Halloween 5, when he should look like a washed up actor like in Halloween 1. Myers in Halloween 5 is played by Don Shanks, and the guy looks better as Michael, moves more like Michael should, and since he's actually got a big build, he doesn't look awkward like the padded up Michael of Halloween 4. Again, a big improvement overall, but still, not exactly what the character should be but at least Michael isn't goofy looking. It doesn't work out so well having a horror villain that looks goofy instead of scary. Oh yeah, something really off about Myers in Halloween 5 though is his house. The humble Myers house literally seen in the first shot of the first movie is now a gothic mansion that looks like it would have a bat cave beneath it. Apparently they couldn't find a house that looked like the original house in Salt Lake City. And since they have a lot of scenes in Halloween 5 in the Myers house, they essentially just warped continuity to meet their needs. Beautiful. Now, I I admit, I've been, uh, burying the lead with this review. Haven't talked much about the film's actual plot, and for good reason. There isn't much of a plot. Now, you might wince at me saying this, cause the Halloween films and horror movies in general don't have super complex stories, but what I mean is, well, Halloween 5 is kind of just aimless. For much of the fifth movie, it doesn't really feel like it's going anywhere. It feels very much like watching a series of loosely connected events happen until the movie eventually ends. Unlike the first four Halloween movies, Halloween 5 lacks a sense of cohesion in its narrative. You follow three or four different characters in the film with different motivations, and it's just difficult to actually get engaged with the movie. But I guess I'll just try my best to break down the different plot threads. Initially, the film naturally follows the story of Rachel Carruthers, the loving foster sister of Jamie, played by Ellie Cornell. But things go off the fucking rails in Rachel's first scene when we're introduced to... <laughs> Tina, Rachel's best friend we're just now meeting. I guess Lindsay Wallace, who we see in Halloween 4, isn't actually Rachel's best friend. 
Tina is the worst. She's just this very loud, ostentatious, hyperactive woman. Mustafa Akkad was hesitant hiring Ellie Cornell as Rachel in the fourth movie. She's more on the plain side, but realistic and intelligent like Laurie Strode. So it feels like Tina was brought into this film as a response to Rachel's character by introducing a vivacious party girl with a wild personality, but it just feels forced. She doesn't feel like she belongs in this story or has much of a stake in it besides knowing Jamie. I love it! Tina never encountered Michael Myers before and feels completely detached from the assertion that he's returned. The inclusion of Tina really throws the tone of this movie out of whack. Halloween 5 honestly looks and sounds like an R-rated Full House episode, like somebody saw Kimmy Gibbler and thought a wacky neighbor would be a good fit for a Halloween movie. Be sensible. <laughs> Tina could have worked as a foil to Rachel with them being an odd couple, unlikely mismatched friends, but unfortunately, Michael goes out of his way to kill Rachel in the first 20 minutes. I'm thinking the film was trying to go for a psycho thing where you kill who seems to be the main character early in the movie, but Janet Leigh had a bunch of scenes with character development that made her demise shocking. Rachel, on the other hand, hangs out with Jamie and Tina for a scene, takes a shower, and gets stabbed. It's not really surprising, it's just sort of eyebrow raising, like, why would someone do that in their script? It's such a non-moment, too. Rachel's death barely even registers as a kill with no gravity for the rest of the film. Like, Rachel's death didn't matter at all. The next scene has Tina and her friend Samantha excited about getting to stay over at the Crothers' house while the family is supposedly away, but uh, nothing ever comes of this either. They never go back to the Crothers' house. What was even the point? You think the party scene that happens later in the movie would logically happen at the Crothers' house, but no, it isn't. It's an unrelated farmhouse. So from Rachel's death onward, much of the movie focuses on Tina and her own group of friends. The Aryan couple, Sammy and Spitz, and Tina's boyfriend, Mike, who makes it clear that the Swiss director of this film's only frame of reference for American teens is old reruns of Happy Days. Halloween 5 feels very confused about the franchise it belongs to because it turns into a Friday the 13th movie with this group of cookie-cutter characters who are trying to get beer for a party. Like, I'm actually supposed to believe that these people aren't old enough to drink. I can believe Michael Myers can survive countless gunshots, but I refuse to believe Mike and Spitz here aren't actually pushing 50. So how many cases can we get? Three cases. Any more and I think old Mr. Casey would uh, know something's up. Adding this movie's list of disposable cliche characters is a duo of bumbling cops who I guess are supposed to be the comedy relief in this film. They don't say or do anything funny, of course, but their out-of-place cartoon sound effect theme music seems to imply that they're supposed to be funny, evidently. <laughs> This music is honestly just short of putting a fucking laugh track in this movie. Rescue cat. Fine dog. That's a job. And we love it. <laughs> Don't get me wrong. Kudos to Sheriff Meeker for restoring Hanfield's police force so quickly, but it's clear he was desperate. Take me, but spare my friend! Oh, adding insult to injury. Come on, Spitz. That's like wearing a Hitler costume in Berlin. I don't know why so many motherfuckers in this town think this is appropriate. Somebody please let me dead right now! Fortunately, well, that was your cops. <laughs> Sorry. Like I said before, Halloween 5, out of all the sequels, feels the most like a Friday the 13th movie. And it's very much paced like a Friday the 13th film, where every 10 minutes there has to be a kill. The movie has all these useless characters thrown in, so I'm gonna do something I attempt to avoid doing, usually, because I want to try to give the horror genre more respect than focusing on the violence and gore. But with this movie, fuck it. Let's just break down most of Michael's kills in Halloween 5 and get it out of the way. Of course, Michael kills the hermit first, and I bet you didn't know this, but the hermit was Ben Tramer's father, stricken by grief from the untimely death of his son. He lived a life in exile and maybe saw his son in Michael Myers and was ultimately betrayed. The hermit's death in Halloween 5 is the only one that truly brings a tear to my eye. And then there's Mike, who is the most by-the-numbers portrayal of a teen bad boy. He's like an uncharismatic version of Fonzie. Uh, don't touch the hair, don't touch the car, dude. And Michael definitely crosses a line touching Mike's car, and certainly touches more than Mike's hair when a rake is driven in the greaser's skull.
Wow, that was a really shitty edit. Then there's Samantha, who is paired up for some reason with a guy named Spitz. It'd be like dating a guy named Jizz or something. Why would you choose a bodily fluid as your nickname? I guess it's fitting because the couple only exist for the movie to have a sex scene and their loving in the barn is weirdly prolonged and uncomfortable. It's pretty clear that the film's European director wanted this to be an artful bit of erotic cinema, but it just kind of feels like the channel got flipped to a softcore porno playing on Cinemax at 2 a.m. Like honestly, Spitz awkwardly pulling out a condom, putting it on, and slowly thrusting into Samantha is a little too much for me. After all the foreplay though, the only penetration that matters is the pitchfork Michael impales Spitz with, and the only warm body fluid that covers Samantha's chest is human blood. Son of a bitch! Ah! I guess the blood budget ran out when they filmed this shot or something. As for the cop characters you'd see in like a Home Alone movie, well, they're murdered off camera. Oh, come on, we couldn't see the cops getting killed with Flintstone sound effects in the background? Let's get back to Jamie. Well, her visions are more than just visions in this movie. It's implied that Jamie has a psychic link with her uncle. They're a dyad in the force. I think that's the fucking dumb thing they called it in the sequel trilogy. The movie does play around with the idea a bit where you're not totally sure if Michael is actually around or if it's Jamie just seeing things, but honestly, I think this telepathic bullshit is simply just a plot contrivance to keep Jamie relevant to the story. I mean, think about it. Jamie spends most of the movie inside this children's clinic with this little wiener kid who stutters. Meanwhile, the middle of the movie focuses on Tina partying with fellow adults pretending to be teens. Is that guy's costume made out of pubes? Uh, anyway, how do you keep this little girl in the fold, especially since her actual foster sister is dead? Oh, I no, give the little girl psychic powers so she can see her uncle going out on a date disguised as another guy named Mike, and I gotta say, that mask is accurate to that dude's face. Great disguise, Michael. So yeah, you have Jamie in constant fear for the dangers of others from a remote location, but she's mute when it's convenient, so it can be a struggle for her to tell the cops that Tina is near a cookie woman. Cookie woman? Just tell him to go to a big titty drawing. That's more specific. Again, Loomis is in the film, and God bless Donald Pleasance. He said he'd probably stop playing Dr. Loomis at Halloween 23, and he does the best he can with what's written for him, but this film's take on Loomis is probably the least enjoyable, at least before the Rob Zombie films. Loomis in Halloween 5 is written purely as a creepy asshole who is constantly harassing and manipulating this little girl to reach his goals. I guess this is logically what Dr. Loomis would be like in this situation, especially after everything he's been through, but it's hard to believe that this dude with a quarter of a Freddy Krueger face would be allowed around a kid. He doesn't even hide how he acts with Jamie. Dr. Loomis. Leave the little girl alone. Loomis was always questionable in his approach to taking down Michael, but with this movie, I feel like his willingness to get a little girl killed is definitely crossing a line, and I feel like Halloween 5 is an unfortunate stain on the perception of Loomis's character. Get the little girl, then, then you're home and safe. Let's just move on to the dumb ending. Jamie and her boyfriend, Stuttering Bill, mount a rescue operation to save Tina's life, and you know what? They're successful in the best possible way. Tina is brutally murdered. Yes! No Halloween 6 for you, bitch! I also gotta give credit to one of this movie's few highlights, Michael chasing Jamie down with a car. It's the first time they did something cool with Michael's ability to drive. I don't know how Jamie's able to outrun a car, though. I guess she's a little fucking Usain Bolt or something. You think if you kill them all, it will go away? Dr. Loomis arranges for a showdown between him and Michael for the girl's life at Stately Myers Manor, and it totally isn't a trap. We just had a distress call from the clinic. Of course, Michael creates a diversion murder, which which causes the dozens of cops standing watch of the Myers mansion to all leave simultaneously, leaving a little girl, a cop, and an old man to slowly make their way out of the mansion and to the police station by themselves. Honestly, this is probably a better outcome than Michael ever could have hoped for. It looks like one of ours. It's a code two. Hey. <laughs> Eddie, do you read me? Dr. Loomis actually has a heart-to-heart -heart chat with Michael, a one-sided discussion with this masked man holding a knife that goes on for like three minutes. It's so bizarre to watch after Loomis has been spending so many movies shooting at this motherfucker. Jenkins. Stop the rage. Now Loomis is gonna try to reason with what he's been calling pure evil? Of course, Loomis, against all odds, is totally successful in convincing Michael to be a good guy. Oh no, I totally didn't see Michael fucking up Loomis coming. Ha!
Michael then hangs out with the cop and proceeds to chase Jamie into the attic where she finds the bodies of Rachel, Triumph the Insult comic dog, and uh, some guy she doesn't know. Thinking swiftly, Jamie hides where Michael will never think to find her, inside the child-sized coffin. Okay, that didn't work, but at least it makes her funeral more convenient. Uncle? Of course, Jamie appeals to the uncle deep down in Michael, who removes his mask and reveals himself to be some fucking wuss, crying like a woman. Pathetic. <laughs> Things really don't get much better when Loomis holds his struggling Jamie out like a piece of meat, baiting Michael Myers in a literally what I can only describe as a Scooby-Doo trap, and Loomis, who actually has a real gun on him, resorts to firing Michael with tranquilizer darts like he's trying to catch King Kong or something. Just when I think the movie has reached the limit of ridiculousness in its finale, Loomis just settles on beating the shit out of Michael with a 2x4 until he has a stroke. Aw, they're cuddling. Ultimately, we're subjected to witnessing Michael completely emasculated as a villain, handcuffed in a jail cell with his mask still on for some fucking reason. I guess they didn't watch the end of the Scooby-Doo episode they based this movie's plot on. The meddling kids usually take the mask off at the end. I take her back to the clinic. This movie's deus ex machina finally arrives, though. R.L. Stein from the Goosebumps TV intro busts Michael out of jail with a flurry of bullets. <laughs> cliffhanger ending to the list of bad decisions in this movie. Well, that was Halloween 5 for you. Now, I give Tina a lot of flack, but it's nothing against the actress Wendy Kaplan. It's just that Tina as a character is emblematic of Halloween 5's flawed writing. Before Halloween 4, the series remained dormant for six years, and because of Halloween 5's rushed production, the series would end up dormant for another six years once again. I give Halloween 5 a Tina out of Rachel. Well, that's the end of October 2020, but there'll be a lot more videos from me on the horizon going into 2021. So get subscribed, thanks for the support, and I hope you have a fun and safe 31st. Happy Halloween! If you like this video, like it, and if you loved it, journey further into the Wolfy Lair by clicking the subscribe and bell buttons to find out when all of my latest videos and streams go live. This video was brought to you by my kind supporters on Patreon, whose names are scrolling by. Support the channel today on Patreon and get access to bonus movie and TV commentaries, audiobooks, comic readings, film live streams, Dreams and credits at the end of videos. Finally, I'd like to give a very special thanks to my true Wolfie Light supporters on Patreon and my YouTube channel memberships for their pledges. Their support is greatly appreciated and helps the channel and my dark influence continue to grow. Thank you all once more from the bottom of my evil heart for your help. Alrighty, Dr. Wolfula signing out. See you all next time at the Wolfula.